welcome to Worship at Valonia United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lauren Delano, and it is a joy to welcome you to worship on this fourth Sunday of Lent as we journey to the cross with Christ. If you are visiting with us, I especially want to welcome you, and I trust that God will meet you wherever you are worshiping today. Though we are worshiping apart as a congregation, we know that God brings us together as one body through the scripture and prayer and songs that we will participate in together today. If you are looking for information about a bulletin or our virtual attendance pad, those things are in the detail or description section on Facebook and YouTube. You can fill out our virtual attendance pad to let us know you worshiped with us, which we would love to know who is worshiping with us today. But you can also put prayer requests there. Those prayer requests can go on our prayer chain or I'm happy to give you a call and offer prayer with you over the phone as well. Just let us know how we can be praying for you. There's also a bulletin in that section, so if you'd rather follow along with the bulletin on your phone or print it off ahead of time, you can find the bulletin there. We're also celebrating UMCOR Sunday, United Methodist Committee on Relief Sunday. You'll hear more about that later, but there's a link in the description section on how you can give to UMCOR as well during this time. I do want to let you know you're invited to have a candle if you would like. We will light the candle at the table in just a little bit. So if you'd like to light a candle as well, you're welcome to do that after the sermon. We'll light that candle. You also are invited to have a coin. If you have your Linton kit, there's a coin in your Linton kit. If you don't have one, just grab any denomination of coin that you have on hand. If there's more than one person worshiping with you at the moment, you all may want to have a coin that you can take with you throughout this week. So I invite you to have that ready as well. I want you to know that as we continue to pre prepare our hearts for Easter, which is coming, and Holy Week, there are a lot of exciting things happening. Our relaunch team is meeting next week, so you'll start hearing about plans for us to return to in-person worship. Please know that we will start with outdoor worship and eventually move to indoor worship when vaccines become widely available for everyone. We will be sending more information about that, more specifics and more details coming soon. We also want you to make plans to join us for Maundy Thursday and Holy Week services, which will be on Facebook and YouTube on those evenings. There'll be two powerful evenings of music and scripture readings from those in our congregation. We do still need scripture readers, so if you are interested in reading scripture for this pre-recorded service, please let me know. We'll be recording next weekend, March 19th through the 21st, and we'd love to have you as a reader. We also still have noon weekday prayer happening Monday through Friday, and would love for you to join that group if you'd like to. You can call in or log on on Zoom, and it would be great and an honor for us to share in prayer time with you. As we celebrate all of the ways God is moving among us in our church life, we give, you, we give God thanks, and we turn to God in praise and worship. Let us worship together.
time we go to God in prayer, lifting up prayers for ourselves, our community, and our world. At the end of each section of the prayer or each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. And you are invited to pray along with me by responding, hear our prayer. We'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let us go to God in an attitude of prayer as we pray together. Lord, our teacher and friend, we ask that you would be our vision, that you would be our wisdom this day and in the days ahead. Meet us where we are and invite us along the path that leads to life. Give us the strength to trust in your word and to make our dwelling place in you, O God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, when our lives feel overwhelming, your presence remains with us. This past week, we have met the one-year mark of when the pandemic began in the U.S. and shut down our lives, and everything changed. As work and school and businesses shut down, we didn't know that this would be our reality for so long. When we felt worried and weary, when we wept and we wondered, you gave us a promise, reminding us that nothing can separate us from your love. With you at work, light and life and love always prevail. And we give you thanks that your light and life and love continue to work in and through each of us and through our faith community, even in these trying times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We confess, Healing Spirit, that while we long for things to be back to normal, we long to hug our family and friends, we long to be able to return to a routine for school and work that does not include masks and social distancing, yet we realize that while we long for normal, the current reality for so many is still challenging. We lift up those who are ill, O oh God, and longing for your healing touch, for those who are dealing with COVID and the aftermath, but also for those who are experiencing other illness, other complications. We give you thanks for their caregivers, whether doctors and nurses or family members and friends that take care of them during this time. We ask that you would offer them comfort and peace as well as they feel weary too. Lord, we know there are many who are lonely, who have had enough of this social isolation and feel like they are left out and forgotten. Lord, we ask that we might be the community they deeply desire, that we might reach out to those who are lonely and in need. And Lord, we ask that you would cover all of those who are physically hungry and spiritually hungry in your grace, O oh God. Fill them with your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we seek your vision, as we seek your wisdom, we know the place we can turn is to Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we turn to our scripture reading for today, which comes from the Gospel of John chapter 2. We're very early on in this gospel Jesus has just turned water into wine as his first sign of abundance. And now he enters the temple in Jerusalem. Let us hear these words from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. 
Then the Jews said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then Jews, The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of this word. Thanks be to God. Amen.
have the privilege of being part of a young clergy continuing education cohort that meets quarterly. It's young clergy from across the south central part of the U.S. And every time we meet together for about a week, we have a certain topic that we're exploring, a topic of pastoral ministry, whether preaching or leading worship or stewardship. And all week we're learning about our leadership style, our strengths, and our growing edges, the places we could improve. Whenever we get to the end of our week, before we depart, our leader always asks us to name a couple of things we're going to improve or work on until we meet again. She calls this exercise going public, meaning we have to share aloud with our other classmates in the cohort what we are going to work on. We have to go public with it so that we can be held accountable so that others can encourage us and prompt us to continue doing this good and hard work. It's a little bit nerve-wracking and vulnerable to share those things with the group because, again, we're sharing some of the things we're not so good at. She'll always ask when it's time to share who's ready to go public, who is ready to share. We are invited to be open to transformation and to name how we desire to be changed in the coming weeks. The holy havoc that Jesus creates in the temple reminds me of this phrase or this activity of going public. In this story, Jesus is going public so that he can challenge others to be changed and transformed in their faith. You see, in the Gospel of John, this moment in the temple is Jesus' first act of public ministry. He has just turned water into wine, his first sign he performs, but he doesn't do that in a big and showy way. Only his mother and his disciples witness the miracle moment. No one else at the wedding knows that Jesus is the one who saved the honor of the wedding host as the wine began to dwindle. As Jesus walks into the temple and turns over tables and throws animals out of the temple. He is going public with who he is, demonstrating that the time has come to challenge the status quo and to shake things up. And Jesus is inviting those who witness this commotion to join him, to enter into an understanding of who Jesus is and who others are invited to become along with him. In the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus doesn't turn over tables in the temple until his final week of his life. Until after he enters into Jerusalem in that triumphal entry. And he already has the eyes of the chief priests and the Roman leadership upon him. But here in John, instead, the writer introduces us to Jesus in this way very early on in his ministry. And sets off Jesus' public ministry right there in the temple. The sign of turning water into wine tells us that Jesus has come to offer abundant life. And we see that again when Jesus feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Jesus is abundant life for all. But this abundance is juxtaposed with the temple scene, which tells us that the abundant life Jesus offers is going to step on some people's toes. It's going to cause chaos. The life Jesus offers doesn't come without challenge for those who accept it, for those who receive it. Jesus is here to bring about new life, and the disciples and others who are gathered to see his, old, his holy reaction, this holy anger, must discern for themselves if they're ready to step into this new life Jesus has to offer. Because here and now is the time for people to know who Jesus is. And here and now is the time when there will be a new way of doing things. Where there will be a disruption to the status quo and to the way things have always been. To understand what triggers Jesus' actions in the temple that day, we need to understand some of the ins and outs of the temple system. Especially during a festival. John tells us that it is the time of the Passover. This is an important detail for many reasons. One, because it will give us a glimpse into why the money changers and other vendors are set up in the temple courts. But also, John wants us to know that on this Passover, Jesus has come to offer a new way 
for the Jewish people to understand the sacrifice, the sacrifice that is required of them on Passover. Jesus has come to be the sacrificial lamb for the Passover feast. We'll get to that second point in a moment, but first we need to have a conversation to understand why there are money changers and people selling animals in the temple. It's hard for us to imagine the majesty of this temple in Jerusalem. As we think about it, we shouldn't imagine a serene and quiet place for worship and prayer alone. Like maybe the worship center is on Sunday mornings when we gather together. Instead, the temple complex, stretching out to be as long as 12 football fields end to end, was a multi-purpose space. It was the center of worship and music, yes, but it was also the place people gathered to discuss politics and what's going on in society. It was a site of national celebration like this Passover feast and also a place people came to mourn. Pilgrims came from all over to celebrate on special days like Passover. It also served as the national bank and the only place where sacrifices to God could be offered. And most importantly, it's the place where God promised to live in the midst of his people, in the midst of the Israelites. The outer court, called the Court of the Gentiles, was set up as a marketplace. This outer court was a place of frenzy and noise, a place of business. This is where the money changers and animal vendors were set up. Remember, the Jewish pilgrims would have traveled from all over, coming to arrive at the temple for the annual Passover celebration, offering sacrifice, desiring to offer sacrifice to God, to thank God for bringing the Israelites out of Egypt and to give thanks to God for providing manna when they were in the wilderness. The pilgrims who came to offer sacrifice to God wouldn't have wanted to travel with their sacrificial animal on their journey because they wouldn't want to risk that animal being injured or deemed unclean by the time they'd made it to their destination. They didn't want the priests deeming their sacrifice unclean. Thus, the practice was to purchase the animal when you arrived at the temple. In order to purchase a sacrificial animal, people had to exchange the currency they brought with them. That was the currency for the part of the Roman Empire they lived in and exchange it for a Tyrian shekel, which was the only type of currency accepted at the temple. The exchange of money would be just like an exchange we would make if we traveled to another country as a tourist. This was all part of the sacrificial system that was set up at the temple. So it's not that Jesus was surprised to see these vendors set up. He's not angry at them for being there. In fact, it's likely that Jesus was used to these interactions and transactions himself. His family probably traveled to the temple on Passover each year to offer their sacrifice to God. So he would have gone through this process of exchanging money and purchasing a dove or a sheep. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, the only story we have of Jesus's early childhood years tells us of when his family traveled to Jerusalem on Passover for this very ritual. And then we hear that his family headed back home and they accidentally left him behind where he was listening to a teacher. It's not in this moment that Jesus is angry with the Jewish pilgrims who are doing what is required of them to sacrifice to God. And it's not even that he is mad at the money changers and animal vendors. Instead, he is upset with the larger system that expects these exchanges to be carried out. Jesus is frustrated for his people, who think they still have to sacrifice to God to satisfy him when Jesus is here to offer a new way of doing things. And Jesus is upset with the temple leaders who have kept things going just as they've always been. Jesus has come to tell them something really big, to tell them that the temple itself will no longer be necessary soon because God's presence doesn't have to be stifled and kept in a box. God doesn't have to be contained to the temple complex any longer. The good news Jesus has delivered through this holy havoc of flipping over tables is that the sacrificial system is coming to an end. And that God is present where Jesus is and even where we are. 
These rituals of the institution that have been held up as sacred are no longer necessary. And in addition to that, it's a shame to Jesus that they've been going through the motions, checking off the boxes of ritual, letting this place be a marketplace, without any expectation that people's hearts will be changed, or that their devotion to God would increase. For Christ, in order for the temple to function as it should, as its reason for existing, people should be drawn closer to God through prayer and praise, devotion and service as they come to the temple. Not through the giving of a sacrifice that cleanses them of sin and gives them permission then to go on and live their lives as they always have, only to come back to the temple again to offer sacrifice. It's not that the temple system, it is not the temple system that produces righteousness before God, but instead it's the practice of faith, of prayer and devotion that we commit to. That is what draws us to God and offers us righteousness in God's eyes. This critique is offered more clearly in the telling of the story in the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus says that the temple has been made a den of robbers. It is not that he's saying that people are robbing others in the temple, for a den is not where people rob someone, but instead it's the place that thieves and robbers return in order to count their spoils. The robbers have found sanctuary in the temple. Those who have perpetuated injustice in the world, those who are sinful, have become comfortable in the temple because they can offer sacrifice, and there is no accountability for holiness in their daily lives. Jesus' critique is that of the practice of religion or ritual just for the sake of it. Something we can be guilty, too, of at times. Of letting religious practices comfort us, make us feel better, so that we can go through the motions of church attendance or worship while not always feeling compelled to change or grow in our everyday lives. The temple, Jesus thought, should be a place where people promise to live a godly life and then keep that promise throughout the week, making this commitment at the temple through praise of God and repentance of sin through sacrifice that then compels them to be different in the world too. Related to this issue of ritual, it is important to the writer of John that we know it is Passover, as I mentioned, and that Jesus is now representing God's Passover lamb. That Jerusalem will be the place where he offers the final sacrifice to God, so that we all might experience freedom and liberation from sin. After Jesus turns over the table, causing a commotion in the outer courts, we hear him challenged by those who have stopped their business deals because of his actions. Those gathered ask him for a sign, or what authority does he have for causing this havoc? And he then talks about the temple being destroyed and rebuilt in three days. Of course, those who are gathered there take his words literally. It would be impossible for this temple that took 46 years to build to be rebuilt in three days. Of course, this is not what Jesus means. Instead, he is revealing to them who he is. He is the true temple. He is the word made flesh. He is the place that God has chosen to make his dwelling. Jesus is telling them there will be a time when they no longer need the temple because that is not the only place God can or will reside. Christ is the presence of God and where he goes, God goes. This, of course, is a lot to take in for those gathered in the temple that day and even for us. Can you imagine someone saying the temple, the church, the place you hold dear that connects you to God will no longer be necessary or relevant. It's like a rug has been pulled out from under them or literally like a table has been flipped over in their lives. Damage being done to the place and ideas and rituals that they hold dear. To the place they felt connected them to God. I've asked you to imagine that, but I actually think we can relate to that in so many ways in this moment. After all, as we mentioned in our prayer time, COVID-19 and the shutdown or the stopping of much of our lives as we knew them has come to a year-long pandemic. We just marked that year this week. We've been living through this for a year, and it's as if 
the pandemic has been a turning over table moment for us as people of faith. I certainly don't want you to hear me saying that God caused the pandemic, that God caused this harm in our lives. I don't think that. But I do think when we had to face the reality of shutdowns and social distancing and mask wearing, a table was flipped. All the rituals, all the things we relied on were no longer there to support us. The rituals of worship and Sunday school and fellowship weren't possible in the way we had always done it. They were no longer the way we could satisfy God, nor was church the place we could go to worship God with all our hearts. We had to find new ways to connect to God. And we learned maybe more than ever that while we love our church building, the church is not the building. God doesn't just live here. Instead, God lives within Christ. God's presence is also within us. God goes with us. God moves among us. And God has continued to find ways to minister to us and others during this pandemic. Think back for a moment to a year ago. A year ago when Pastor James and the staff and the leadership of this congregation had to make hard decisions to cancel worship due to the COVID pandemic beginning to sweep across our world. What was your reaction to that change? Did it feel uncomfortable, unbearable? Were you challenged in your faith? I imagine it caused great discomfort even grief, and it certainly brought challenge to your faith life. We were asked to rethink everything about how we gathered for church and what it means to praise and love God. We had to wonder if we could meet God online, or better yet, if God would meet us there, or if we might close ourselves off to letting God work and move through different mediums than we're used to. Just like in the temple, as Jesus offered a new way of doing things, saying this temple sacrifice system is obsolete, it's no longer necessary. It's prayer and praise of God, seeking forgiveness, serving others that's essential. Just like that moment, we had to get back to the basics of who we were as a church too. Figurative tables were flipped in our individual faith lives and in our collective faith as a community. It took courage for Jesus to walk into the temple that day to point to the changes that needed to be made. And it took courage for those listening to him and witnessing to his anger at the system to follow him, to embrace the change he was offering. As you think about the last year, when have you had to courageously embrace change? When have you had to say yes to being challenged in your faith? How has God worked through you in this challenging time? I invite you to think about those same questions in regards to the church. Where have you seen our church be challenged by the change that COVID has brought into our lives? Where have you seen us look to what is important? Discerning what is just ritual or where we were just going through the motions. And to notice where God was leading us to change and grow together. Christ's anger in the temple that day was really an invitation it was a moment where he courageously stepped out in faith, trusting that God had led him to that moment to go public with who he was, the Son of God, the Messiah. And it was an invitation to those gathered to look at their faith lives, to see how they could enter into relationship with God in new ways, and to discern how they could follow Jesus, trusting that the presence of God lived and moved and breathed, not just in the temple, but beyond the temple too. The good news is that God's presence moves and lives within us too. Even when we are challenged in our faith, we are called to be courageous. Sure, our toes may get stepped on at times. Sure, it might take us a little bit to warm up to the idea of change, but it's often in these moments. When we wanna push back, when we wanna cry out, really God, this is what you're asking of me? It's in those moments that we often know God is at work and that we need to pay attention. Friends, may you have the courage to step out in faith this week, 
to trust that God's stirring in this time, in this place, that God is calling us to change, that God asks for transformation, and that we're invited to look at our own faith lives and the things that we do, the rituals and the going through the motion, and to maybe make a commitment to returning to the basics of prayer and praise, of seeking forgiveness, of loving God through a walk in creation or a daily time of devotion, so that you might get to participate in the holy work of courageously following after Jesus. Amen. At this time, Barb Wilms is going to lead us through our time of at-the-table prayer. When she lights this candle, you will be invited to light a candle as well at home. You will need your coin after our time of prayer, so I invite you to have that as well. Living a life of faith takes courage. And sometimes we're people who are called to seek justice. Jesus is someone who always stands up for the lost and least of these, and we are invited into that work as well. Today we pray together that God might guide us into the virtue of courage. Let us pray. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to the desires of your kingdom. Show us what we should see, but from which we hide our eyes. Show us what people are longing for. Show us the ways we could help to bring about your kingdom now and not later, offering justice and peace to all people. Give us the courage to be where you are, Christ our Lord. We are grateful for the courage and determination you make available to us to sustain our efforts to work for better relationships, for reconciliation, for justice, and for peace. Help us to find the language and the courage to share our faith stories with each other and to be open and honest and humble in all our intentions. Amen. Thank you, Barb, for leading us through that time of prayer, which calls us to be courageous. Before I wrote this sermon, I thought I was going to be asking you to make bold moves in your faith life, to shake things up. But what I realized through this passage and through my study of this passage is that Jesus does the big things for us so that we can have courage to accept the invitation Christ offers us. Christ flipped over tables in the temple. Eventually, he dies on the cross for us, offering an ultimate sacrifice. Jesus offers courage as the Son of God and shows us the way to life everlasting. He offers us an invitation to love, to reconciliation with God and others, to justice. And I want you to know that starts with our own faith lives, having the courage to change in our faith lives, because change is hard. We know that from the last year, change can be so hard. So I want to invite you to take your coin, whether it's the coin that was in your Lenten kit or a quarter or a penny that you have, and I want to invite you to either carry it around in your pocket all week if you um, have pockets, if you're wearing dresses or skirts that might be harder, maybe put it by your bedside table or at your bathroom sink, somewhere where you're going to see it each day. And I want you to use it as a reminder of the courage you're invited to take this week in your faith life. If it's in your pocket, 
Maybe when you need some courage, you can reach to it. Reach for it. And let it be a reminder of the courage Jesus invites us to. I want you to know that change doesn't have to be big. Sometimes a small change can lead to a great impact in our faith lives. Maybe you just need to introduce a time of reading scripture into your day. Maybe saying a prayer before bed or at a meal. Maybe talking to a friend about your faith or about some of your challenges. Maybe bringing some canned goods for our Spirit of Bologna food ministry that we support. Just a small thing is an invitation into God's big gifts for us. So I invite you to use this coin to encourage you to take courage, to be courageous, to know that as you take one small step to be courageous in the invitation Jesus offers to us of love and grace, that God will be with you, that God is already present with you, that God goes with you and gives you the strength and spirit to be courageous. Might you accept the invitation? Amen. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, today we are celebrating UMCOR Sunday, United Methodist Committee on Relief Sunday. We have six special Sundays in the United Methodist Church where we celebrate the connectional ministries of the church. While we love our church and our local community, we also get to support churches and ministries around the world as Methodists go to work to care for others. UMCOR offers to serve and care for communities and people in the midst of tragedy, often natural disasters, but sometimes other humanitarian disasters. UMCOR is often the first on the ground in a place that needs aid, and they promise that 100% of the donations you make to UMCOR go directly to relief. If you want to support UMCOR, you're invited to give to them as a special or over and above donation today. There's information about how to give in the description section on Facebook. Also today during our offering time where we celebrate not just the gifts of our tithes and offerings, but the gifts of service and special skills people give, I want to give thanks to our mowing and groundskeeping team who we're lovingly calling Blades of Glory. They have offered their gift of time and resources to keep our grounds at the church looking nice, to cutting the grass during the spring and summer and fall, and to making sure that it's a place that looks welcoming and invitational. If you are interested in helping to be part of the grounds crew, we would love to know that. We'd love to get you plugged in so that we can have a team that rotates and doesn't have to take on all of the work on their own. You can contact the church office or Larry Oberstee, the team leader, and we can get you plugged into this ministry. Finally, I want to say a word of thanks to you as a congregation. You'll notice in the bulletin at the top of the announcements each week, we put a generosity report there, which tells you how much we desire to receive each week in tithes and offerings to help with the day-to-day -day mission and ministry at Valonia United Methodist. Last week, for the first time, this, week, this year, you exceeded that weekly need, and we are so grateful. I'm so grateful for your generosity, and I ask that you would continue to give with that spirit of generosity. As spring arrives, new opportunities will come with that for us as a congregation to gather together. And so I just want to encourage you and give thanks to you for being a generous church. If you would like to give to Valonia United Methodist Church today, I invite you to do that in a few easy ways. You can mail us a check. You can come by the church office between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Or you can go to our Facebook page and click Shop Now, and that will take you to our online giving platform. For all the ways God has moved you to be generous, whether through gifts of prayers, presents, service, your tithes and offerings, your witness, I am grateful and this congregation is grateful as well. Let us pray together. Gracious God, receive these gifts that we offer with thanksgiving. Bless them and multiply them so that we might be your hands and feet at this church and in our community. 
Be with those at UMCOR who seek to relieve the suffering of your people, who train and equip staff and volunteers to go out into the world to care for people in their time of deepest need and to create wholeness in the midst of brokenness. Bless us and bless UMCOR this day. Amen. Testaments, please join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God 
the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Friends, as we close worship today, I invite you to be courageous. It doesn't have to be in big ways. It doesn't have to be in ways that cause a commotion, but instead to be in courageous to take the invitation Christ offers, to enter into a life of faith, one that you strive to improve daily. Remember, small changes in our faith lives can make a big impact on our lives, on our relationship with God, and our relationship with others. So I invite you to let this coin guide you and remind you to be courageous this week, to seek after God because we are invited to into a wild and courageous way of life, where love and light prevail. Amen. Go in peace.